Hello and welcome to I-80 Sports Basketball Talk. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. As you can see, Mongo is not with us today, but that's all feel right. Better, Mongo. Do please feel better. Uh, he uh, w- woke up, wasn't feeling good. Uh, tried to sleep it off again, didn't work. So we'll we'll see you next week. Um, as you Shout can out see, to Jeff you as have, well. You have me, Kilroy, and we got the good old Keck Master here. The very important CAC master. This man here is so important to us. Uh, and so is everyone here in IE Sports. But And it says Suns Toad because I'm wearing a Phoenix Suns jersey today. Yeah, uh, I'm wearing a, well, you can't read it. So, uh, you know, you don't need to see it. It's just it's a basketball. That's all you see and that's all you get. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, so yeah, so today we got a uh, we got a bit of news that happened around the NBA, and we're gonna go over that, and then we're gonna go over the uh, the first two games of the NBA Finals. So let's start with um, the kind of big news uh, out of Utah. Um, uh, Quinn Snyder, Mr. Snyder. I don't remember his first name. Dan or is Quinn. It Quinn? I don't remember. Quinn. Quinn. I was, yeah, yeah, Dan is the, is the Atlanta Hawks, former Atlanta Hawks. <laughs> no, not Dan Quinn. No, Quinn Snyder. Uh, Atlanta Falcons, sorry. Uh, anyway, so Dan Quinn, um, sorry, nope. Quinn Snyder. Quinn Snyder uh, yesterday resigned from the uh, Utah Jazz as their head coach. His reasoning he gave after yeah, after eight seasons, his reasoning was he felt that they needed a change of voice, and that was the only way to get them over the hump. That's very humble of him to say. Um, but boy, that is a very bad look, especially seeing there's no first off, no openings other than one, the uh, which is close to being filled anyway. Um, and the Lakers wanted him, so like this is like a real bad feel bad situation for the Lakers, right. Yeah, you know what the funny thing is? I Usually you hear the need for a change of voice from management, not from the coach himself. But I think there were signs in Utah that the tenure was going to end at some point. And I thought that this was, you know, I, I, I look at it this way. I don't know much about Mr. Snyder before he became um, the Utah Jazz head coach, but by all accounts, he seems this seems to be, you know, pretty genuine in that he he's coached this team for eight years. So he knows better than most other people, you know, what this team needs. And, you know, a, a lot of the disappointment uh that's been coming off recently with the Utah Jazz just not being able to get to the uh Western Conference Finals, I think at some point he knows that a change needs to be made if this group of players is gonna be it. If, the, if they're ever going to do it, he knows that a big change needed to be made. And it's sad but true, but it is it is easier to change the head coach than it is to change, you know, 12 to 15 basketball players. That's true. Now, I think part of his reasoning might have been as well that he knew that his uh, other than his time was pretty much up after this year, right? Like, he would have gotten at least one more season. We know that. they They at least... It seems like they weren't planning on. Yeah, this wasn't like a behind the scenes. Oh, you should, you know, just resign type of thing. He was most likely getting at least one more season with them, which makes you uh, wonder whether or not he knew that it was that this team was not going to make enough changes. Because let's be honest, the, the other than trading Rudy Gobert or Donovan Mitchell, they don't really have much assets wise to move around. Um, they might have draft picks, but you know they're 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 slotted to be uh, late first round picks. No one wants that, you know, or not that no one wants it, but they want that plus a young good player or something. And, and there's just not much on the Utah team 
that is enticing outside of Donovan Mitchell or Rudy Gobert. Um, and he knows that there's not much that they can do. His, he knows that he's, that his, he can't coach these guys anymore. Donovan Mitchell's been there for the past five years. Rudy Gobert has been there uh, the past eight years uh, with Mr. Snyder. And he, he knows he can only get so much out of them. And that this is what they can get out. They are heavily invested in Mike Conley. I doubt they can trade that contract because that was a horrible re-signing. Um, and, and for a guy who couldn't stay healthy before he came to the jazz. So I don't know why they thought he was going to magically stay healthy for them when they gave him that huge crime. I think it was this past off season. They've re-signed him. Uh, there wasn't many options. The point point guard market is dry. They probably, you know, look at the Knicks, the Knicks struggled to, to find a, a point guard this past off season. They went for, they've been a struggling for and years. Don't forget. Uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of sad in a way, but I think there's a little bit of hope for Quinn Snyder. I don't think I think the possible I think what's likely going to happen unless some miracle o- job opening get he, he gets is he's either going to sit out a year or become an assistant somewhere. San Antonio. There's a there's a shout out to you guys. And I think what's likely to happen is that there's a strong chance he might become the next San Antonio Spurs head coach once uh, the respected Mr. Greg Popovich decides that he's had enough of head coaching. I mean, that's an option. I definitely think he's going to be an assistant coach this year just because there's no benefit for him sitting out. He can go be a coach for like half of the – like he can go to Golden State and be on their bench and help them – win a championship again next year or attend Boost you know attempt to win a championship. He can go to the to the to the Nets and be an assistant there for a year or any of these contending teams just sit there, be an assistant that excuse me, he already has a big resume as a eight years as a coach in Utah of success. Making six out of the eight years into the playoffs is is not a small feat, especially seeing how bad that Utah team was when he got there. You know, we're not talking about the team that was, you know, with Carlos Boozer and and um, Darren Williams, we're talking about the team was pretty, pretty, pretty far from that. I'm pretty sure at that point, Darren Williams was on the Nets or close to being on the Nets, um, and that team was just not good. That they, 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 he took a flyer on Rudy Gobert, and Rudy Gobert panned out for him. Um, and you know, you know, Donovan Mitchell is an undersized two, even though. We are at this point in the league where there's a lot of positionless plays. He's done a lot with a with with very little around him, and and that's not saying that Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert are bad players. You know, we're talking about two of the top players at their respective positions. But in the league, yeah, in the league. But the problem is, outside of that, who do they have that's even you know top? 15 in the I couldn't position. name a, t- a, th- a t- another top uh league player on their roster to be honest with you so yeah they do need some improvement I think that now though it's interesting there's a little bit of fallout from this because now Donovan Mitchell did come out with a tweet saying that he's uh I'm paraphrasing obviously but he's kind of confused about his future and there's a, there's some and when there's smoke there's a little bit of fire there's a possibility that the Donovan Mitchell trade market has just opened up at least a little bit more with this uh, sudden resignation by uh, Quinn Snyder. I think going back to, but let's go back to Quinn Snyder for a second. I don't mm-hmm. know that he would go to the Nets as an assistant. Well, it was just an example, but yeah, as an assistant, just because the Nets want people want you know players and coaches who are all in, and I kind of get the feeling that Quinn Snyder is just looking for a stopgap job. I kind of think that he would go to either the Spurs, or a team with a Greg Popovich disciple, like may, like maybe the Boston Celtics, you know? Ime Udoka did come from the Popovich tree. You never know. It's it's worth it's worth it's worth taking a flyer on him as an assistant. It is, it is. Um I I mean if I was him, I'd be looking at Golden State because a lot of ex coaches went to Golden State and got <laughs> got a job again. Um, and I think didn't Steve Kerr come from the Popovich tree as well? I don't recall. I don't remember if he was an assistant. Oh, he or might not. not have been. Yeah, I think uh, he there's been a lot. Head There's like a from million. The booth. So, um, he played for him, but I don't think. I think you're right. I don't think he coached under. Uh, I, I honestly don't remember. But the um, no, I, I think this. I don't think Steve Kerr was an assistant or anything. I think he just came straight yeah. in. I think yeah. you're right. Um, 
But back to the Donovan Mitchell situation, I think that that might have been part of what made Quinn want to leave, right? Because now it's better to leave now before your star's traded where you still look like a good coach. Yeah. Then he's gone and you get exposed because your team doesn't have much talent out at that point, right? Because you're like, losing one of the trying best. To PM, mm-hmm. Like the trade, you know, like he's trying to get out before they trade right either or both which which there's word that they are they're in that they are going to uh trade that he's even before this there was talk that donovan mitchell wasn't happy and that he wanted out there was rumors of always which there's always going to be rumors with the knicks but there was rumors that the knicks were interested in him uh whether or not he was interested in the knicks is neither here nor there i mean but the the organization is interested in him miami heat are interested in him portland trailblazers would most definitely want him there's all these different teams there's 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 competition for a service that should he become officially available right and miami has quite a nice package that they can trade they can make a package around tyler hero and duncan robinson and Uh draft picks to go out and get him to make you know for duncan robinson mostly for contract reasons to fill out but you know it would be silly for for utah not to do that they're getting back a young good shooting guard to replace the young good shooting guard they just left Tyler Hero is very good, and that's something we're going to talk about also in a moment after this is we're going to talk about the Miami Heat. Um, and then draft picks from the Heat aren't going to be great, but at the same time, you, you know, if you're lucky, you can get those maybe a few years down the road when Jimmy Butler's retiring or, or not on another team player, and, and, you know, maybe you can get a decent, you know, mid, mid-round pick, um, you know, maybe in the, you know, 15 to 20 range instead of, you know, in the late twenties, but either yeah. way, I, I see, it makes sense that he wanted to leave. Um, and it makes sense that they didn't fire him because they're they're for them. It's more beneficial to keep him one more year, try to get a championship. If not move on from Rudy Gobert, move on from him. I, I don't think they're going to trade either Rudy Gobert or, Donovan Mitchell this offseason, maybe to closer to the trade deadline if the team does not look good and they're just fall out flat, especially now that they're going to have a new head coach. You don't know how the players are going to work together. Um, but they're not going to go for a full rebuild unless they have to and they're getting great value, right? Like Oklahoma, let's say OKC gives them eight, all 18 of their draft picks that they've accumulated. <laughs> that would be a Mongo fantasy trade, my friends, but I don't think that I don't think it's going to be quite that rich. Right. But what if they can get something of value out of it, then they, they they could maybe SGA and a couple of first rounders for Donovan Mitchell. I would do that if I'm OKC. And if I'm Utah, I would do that. Okay, so because they have Josh Giddy. So Josh Giddy can run the, the, the can run the one. Then you have Donovan Mitchell. And now you have Donovan Mitchell who's a six one two with a big point guard in Josh Giddy. So here's a question for you. How, how, what kind of record at the trade deadline next year? Let's assume for purposes of this conversation that the trade deadline is 60 games, argument's sake. What kind of record do you think uh, the Utah Jazz would consider trading at least one, if not both, of their players? Uh, you, you have 60. Is it, Let's it's say the at, trade deadline is 60 games. All right, 60 games. You have to be... Um, Like, I don't know, 20 to 25 wins. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm, it, I was thinking around the same. I, I was thinking, and they might even be willing to do it if they're under if they're under 500. Anywhere under 500. Yeah, uh, but definitely, definitely under 500. I don't think, I think if they're, I don't think close to, I, like if they're like two games under 500, they won't do it because at that point you still have a shot. Um, I think it has to be at least five to 10 games under 500. Or tenth place, or like twelfth place in the West, or worse. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh. So yeah, I mean, and that that whole. I don't know who they're gonna get. I don't know. Even if they get a, I just this team is not complete. Um, they just don't have money. NBA money is very weird. Is especially once you like re-sign a bunch of your own players to max contracts, you're kind of stuck in a weird spot. Um, and if you're not yeah, one of the top the contenders. Knicks. You're just never, you know, you're in an ugly, you know, spiral. I mean, that's why Golden State has made six of the past eight NBA finals. You know, that's there's a reason for that is because they got good players and they're all on max contracts. 
And everyone's like, oh, well, what are they going to do with Jordan Poole? Poole. It's like, well, you give him a max contract because the NBA's salary allows uh, cap allows you to. You just have to pay a luxury tax. If you're winning championships, who cares? Yeah. Which is that's what the Golden State Warriors owner said earlier in it when he with this team. As long as we're contending for championships, I'm gl- I'll gladly pay luxury tax. And you know what? Yeah. Not every owner would do that. And I agree. the way Jordan Poole's playing, maybe you move on from you know one of these. Uh, obviously, you're not going to move on from from Steph, but maybe you move on from Draymond. Maybe you move on from uh, probably Clay, Clay Thompson. Thompson. Maybe you move on from someone who you're not as thrilled about because they're older and they're not playing as well. And you have a nice young guard. This is two years in a row now. Jordan Poole's played well. Last year, we you know it was questions about well, let's see how he does. You know, can he do this consistently? And then this year, he came out and he's been fantastic. Yeah. I agree. Uh, um, on to the uh, Miami Heat real quick before we jump into the NBA Finals. Uh, so Pat Riley came out today, um, I guess maybe this weekend, something he was doing an interview. I'm not quite sure where this came from, but he said a couple of things that were a little bit... More than a couple of things. They're, they're, they're a bit of a red flag that makes you a little bit worried as a as a, a fan of the heat which i am not but i'm just saying if you're a fan and of the it heat, makes you happy if you're uh, if you dislike the heat yes um he came out and said that kyle lowry was pre- he didn't say it directly but he pretty much came out and said that he was out of shape and he needs to get in shape and i'm and i'm gonna pretty much make sure he gets in he's that he stays in shape um, and that that was the main reason he had these hamstring injuries, which it could be. I'm not gonna lie, but at the same time, ask James if, Harden. <laughs> yeah, once you have a hamstring injury, it's just hard to recover from it. It doesn't matter what how good of shape you're in. It's just it. The only thing that heals it is time. Um, and then also he came out Hold and on. said, "Oh yeah, well I that, wanted to, I wanted to pause on the on on the Kyle Lowry thing because there was another interesting topic that came out." It came out a few years ago, but it resurfaced with this story. You know, a good enemy, a go, not enemy, good, a good friend of the NBA, Mr. Jermaine O'Neal. You might have heard of him from back in the 2000s. So he was on the Miami Heat before, right before they signed uh, LeBron James, Dwayne, uh, Dwayne, re-signed Dwayne Wade, and re-signed Chris Bosh. And this was, he was in his late 30s at this point. He had already established himself as a great player, at least you know, three all-star appearances or something like that. And he admitted during a radio show or podcast, like at some point in the past, that he chose not to resign with the Heat because the, he 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 knew that they were very stringent on in-shape requirements. Like they have a rule, according to him, that your maximum body fat percentage has to be 8% or less. And he was like, at that point in the, at that point in time, I was like, I don't want to have to choose between that and his Oreos, which which made for a funny, you know, made for a funny story. And I'm sure there were lots of Oreo jokes out there. But, you know, all kidding aside, down in, I'm not surprised that Pat Riley would have instituted, you know, a very strict, you know, uh, weight percentage fitness rule like that. And I'm sure, and just so you guys know, I'm sure that's not the only, you know, uh, fitness rule that's in place. I'm sure there are many more that we haven't heard from yet. But that's the oh. one, the most famous one because Jermaine O'Neal admitted yeah. to it. Ab- absolutely, and if you really think about it, um, it you know that that if that if this was the 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 one that Jermaine O'Neal felt the most comfortable mentioning, and it's like, well, you know, you're thinking about that, but you know, eight percent is is so low for, but you know, we are talking about professional athletes, but we're talking about like a center where centers typically, especially back then, centers typically were bigger body players. They had literally, he replaced Shaquille O'Neal. That's who the center was before Jermaine O'Neal got there. Yeah. Talk about a guy who had way more than 8% body fat. Now, right, <laughs> he has significantly more muscle than I do. And I'm not saying he was, you know, by any means, you know, out of shape or anything, but he definitely was heavy, you know, was a heavy boy who I'd could be move to around bet, very I, well. I'm not a gambling man, but I'd be willing to bet that Shaquille O'Neal was definitely more than 8% body fat. But, you know, when you're talking about a Hall of Fame player versus uh, a, a good, not great player, yeah. you know, there's a little bit more leniency. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. They definitely, they definitely gave him some allowances there. Because um, they, they liked him. Might... 
He brought he brought them up. He brought them Wade. He helped bring them to the finals where Wade won his first title back in 06. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that also might explain why they had trouble after Shaq left before LeBron decided to go to Miami. And now, mind you, Miami really did struggle most of Dwayne Wade's time there before outside of the you know couple of years together with Shaq. Because no one wanted, who wanted to go to Miami? No, I mean, not, not Miami was a wonderful is a wonderful city for, but it wasn't like a destination for basketball. Yeah, it, you know, until LeBron decided he wanted to go there, then everyone was like, "Oh, let's go play with LeBron," because that's how it works. Chris Bosh went there. Yep. I mean, the the uh, Dwayne Wade, LeBron, and Chris Bosh thing almost happened in New York. They like all three of them were gonna go wherever. They just all picked the Heat because it seemed it was the easiest to work out. Yeah, because Dwayne Wade was already there, you know. Um, but yeah, so you know, again, that's just the one thing that came out about that. So you know, and Kyle Lowry is a little bit of a thicker boy, but he's not like out of shape and fat or anything like that. He's not like you know, no. it's not like there's Mo Vaughn out there playing point guard, I, right? Like. <laughs> I, okay, so Kyle Lowry's a little bit bigger, but I was not, I was never going to say he's on the fat scale. No way in heck. Heck no. You know, and he he's on the shorter side, and shorter uh, point guards typically can, especially when they're older, get thick, which is fine. You want that in your point guards because they're, they're typically a thick like point guard punishment. is a strong point guard. You know, they're driving to the basket, getting hit by, a taller, larger players, you want them to have a little bit of stuff so that they don't just break stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, so that that's interesting, but maybe that's also his 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 uh his way of saying uh you have to improve or we're trading you, which is probably gonna happen anyway, because they are they are looking at Donovan Mitchell, they're looking at uh uh Zach Levine, they're looking at a bunch of players, and the other thing that came out was Tyler Hero said last week that he wants to be that he feels he's earned starter minutes and that he should become a starter. It's his fourth year. He's he's played well pretty much every year. Like even his down year was that's quotes was still a good year. It was not bad. It was just not as good as his rook is his first year, which is hard to improve on. You know, it's it's not easy. There's a sophomore slump for a reason. I'm not sure if it was actually a sophomore year or something, but like your first year that you break out and you're good, usually the year after there's a bit of a regression because teams start knowing yeah, how to yeah. play you. You either then rebound, and which is what he did, or you just fall into the same routine and same pattern and you're not able to break it. Uh, but Pat Riley came out and said, you'll get started minutes when you're a two, uh, you'll become a starter when you're a two-way player. Means defense. That's a, That's like, you're talking about one of the better young shooting guards in the league where most of the time shooting guards are not required to play defense to to that or like extensive defense, especially when you have Jimmy Butler, who's one of the best two-way players who guards guards all the time. Who I would like Jimmy to Butler play. has played the point guard, the shooting guard, the small forward, and probably the power forward position his whole career, pretty much his whole career in Chicago. He played th the small the point and the shooting guard once Derrick Rose left. So you don't have to worry about like him. You don't have to worry about every player playing defense when you have one of the best defensive players in the league already on your team. You have two. Bam two. is really good defensive, and then you have Jimmy Bam Butler who's really good defensive. It's fine to have one offensive player who's just offense, and he's not terrible on defense. He's not great, but it's not terrible. I would like to point out that this could be, you know, uh, Pat Riley being a. Uh, master motivator in these in these two stories so far you know pat riley did have you know uh, did have a reputation of like pushing strange buttons as a head coach so i'm i think there's there's a method to pat riley's meth um, madness going on with both of these stories here so i think i think he's trying to light a fire under both of these guys to improve so I can understand that as what he's doing for Kyle Lowry because Lowry is an older player. He's used to that. But as as Mongo talked about last week, the big problem that Tyler Hero had was the lack of confidence because he he struggled, and no one was and people were uh, were against him. 
So what? why would you come out and try and then mess with him psychologically again? I don't think, though, that this is – I don't think, though, that this is as harsh as the uh, – you know, the fools who want him out of town because he was playing hurt and they didn't realize it. Well, I don't think this it, is as harsh as that, though. It's not as harsh, but you don't know what his psyche is, right? Like, if the other thing hurt him and he still hasn't fully recovered, first off, Pat did not have to say that to the media, right? He could have said that behind closed doors, been like, look, Tyler, we like you a lot. We want you to be good, but you need to play better defense, be a better two-way player for us before we talk about you being a starter. Correct. Like, I mean, I understand he wants to motivate a player, but if a player is already, if you've already tried this, the, the, this method of, oh, let's, uh, let's insult a player to try to motivate them, that, that may have worked back in the 90s and when, when, when Pat was coaching the Knicks, but that doesn't work nowadays. It just doesn't, especially with younger people. It, it doesn't can, work it, like that. It can still work, but I think you have to know who you have on your team. And I think, I think Pat Riley, Pat Riley's on to something here where I don't think he does this unless he saw something recently that Tyler Hero's okay. Like if he thought Tyler Hero was totally uh, brain farted, shattered from all the negative criticism that he un got undeservedly, I don't think he says this. I think, I think somewhere between uh, when the Heat lost and when he made this comments, something. Uh, Tyler Hero said, made Pat, made Pat Riley think that this guy's tough enough. He can take what I'm about to say. I well, think, well, I think well, there's something of that. I, I don't know. I don't, uh, I, I, um, uh, I mean this in the nicest way possible, but his generation, uh, and older in general does not quite, they don't quite take into account how people feel. You, well, that's the, well, that's the thing. I mean, like, but I think, I think you're right that th this could also be a generational thing because you know there's a lot of people nowadays not just in sports but you know all over the place who can't handle harsh criticism at all but right and this think, to me so let me let me preface it with this i don't think this is this is harsh criticism no not at because all because at the same time yeah you want your players to be two boy players back in the day that's the thing a coach could come out and say and it would motivate like that if you say that if someone's if uh if he said that to kobe that would have just made Kobe want to play even harder, prove him wrong. And this may make Tyler Hero want to prove him wrong. But it's a that's quite the gamble to take, especially to me. It's if I'm in his shoes, I wouldn't have taken that gamble because of what happened already. If if Tyler Hero didn't set that precedent by coming out and saying he was a little bit upset with how things were handled that year, then I would maybe have, have tried something like that. But it's the fact that it they they the the player or the 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 fans and the, I'm not sure I'm assuming there was something in the coaching staff too that weren't happy, and that's why that happened. That he got benched or rebenched. Oh, you mean during Game Seven? No, 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 no. That was injury. I'm talking about his because remember his second year he went he was was the starter for a while. Oh, Him yeah, and Duncan right. Robinson both started. Yeah, and then he got bent. He got benched. Yeah. Well, only time will tell. You no, know, th that's the only answer to this story. I think time will tell whether this move works or this this comment by Pat Riley uh, just wasn't appropriate and doesn't work. Only time will tell, and we're gonna find out over the next. I'd say give it two years. One to two years, we'll find out whether Tyler Hero becomes the two way player they're seeking or they end up trading him. I think whatever. he's gone before then. I think this offseason there's going to be a major change in Miami. I well, think he's he been traded. And I, if they can get a point guard or a guard and have Jimmy Butler play point, they're going to get rid of Kyle Lowry too. They'll they'll package both and send them out. Well, if Maybe not together, but they'll do. I There's going to be big, big trades. Yeah. yeah. I think I, they're going to try to get Joel Embiid because Joel wants to play there. And I think they want to get Donovan loves. Mitchell. By the way, uh, um, viewers, don't forget we mentioned in earlier episodes that Joel Embiid loves Jimmy Butler and was questioning why the Sixers got rid of him. So don't forget about that. So um, I, I can I, see them. Yep. I do think that um, if Tyler Hero gets traded, he should look at it as like, okay, let's let's go. Let me try to earn the starting job because he'll. I think if he does get traded, he'll have a better chance of landing a starting job elsewhere. 
Oh, I think him going elsewhere is the best thing for him. I don't I think, think I don't think it's automatic, but I do think that if he wants to become a starter, I think it might end up being better if he goes elsewhere. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I think it puts him in the best position to succeed is going elsewhere. I think he is going to be handicapped in Miami, so I think he. I think Miami is going to go get Joel, and they're going to go get Donovan Mitchell, and they'll have that as their and with um this is big three with Jimmy Butler as their big three. Speaking of big three. Let's talk about the finals. All right. You have the Golden State Warriors and the Boston Celtics. They are now tied at one game apiece. Boston Celtics came in in game one, stole stole one. Uh, Going back, the 40 Warriors to were up in most the of the game. And then of they, game one. Hmm? they stormed back 40 to 16 in the fourth quarter of game yep. one to turn a 12 point fourth quarter beginning of the quarter deficit to a 12 point victory. So that is that is something pretty big. Um, and then they came back and fell flat in game two. Uh, well, the, both of these were pretty were pretty much blowouts. Um, you know, you had twenty eight to one twenty to uh, one hundred eight in game one, and then you had uh, one oh uh, seven to eighty eight. Uh, both of them were double digit wins. One was much closer than the other. Uh, well, that's because the, you had the lead switching teams right. in the fourth quarter. I think the uh, biggest problem for the Celtics is that they come out of the third quarter. They come out in the third quarter and they give up these big uh, third quarters to Golden State. And they were able to survive in game one, but they just couldn't do it in game in game two. And now, I, I will have to say, uh, Boston might have might be a bit worried or should be a bit worried. They lost. Uh, they won game one. But that was with Clay shooting six for fourteen from the field, which isn't great. Three for seven from three, took zero free throws. He had a pretty bad game. And then yesterday's game, this is today's Monday, by the way, uh, June sixth. He came out and was even was even worse. He went four for nineteen, and then they got blown out. So that's 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 worrisome if I'm the Celtics. And you add in the fact that Wiggins had a bad game yesterday. He was four for twelve. Yeah, uh, and Steph Curry didn't have particularly a great shooting game. He was 9 for 21. Uh, the team as a whole, what did they shoot? They shot 45% from the field, which isn't great, and then 40% from three, which helps. Uh, the Celtics shot also 40% from three. They were, uh, both shot 15 for 37, actually. It's just the Celtics shot worse from the field. They were 30 for eight, 80 for 37 and a half. Um, you might want to mention... Uh... Turnovers, because uh, I, I think I saw somewhere that Golden State had 33 points off Boston's 18 turnovers in game two. And you just yeah. can't give the ball away like that and expect to win a game. No, but both teams had a lot. 18 and 12 are both pretty high 12's turnovers. Not that it's just high. that Boston didn't capitalize on theirs like my like uh, Golden State did. Well, 12's not that high. If you think about it, the average turnovers for a team is roughly around the 14 15 range so 12 and considering golden state occasionally get occasionally pretends like they're santa claus and give the, gives the ball away like crazy 12 is actually a low number for the golden state warriors as, as a defensive team if you're if you hang your hat on defense you just cannot give extra possessions to the mm -hmm. opponents because you just have to work that much harder to play defense in transition and eventually at some point that defense will break down I will say this, um, going into game three, which is on um, Wednesday. Wednesday night, 9 p.m. for This is reason. really going to be very t a big test for Ime Aduka. Uh, or, I'm sorry, I, I know I said his last name Yudoka? wrong. Yeah, with his adjustments. Can he adjust? Can he make this a close game? Uh, they don't have to win. You would obviously want to win because, you, you know, but you don't have to win. Just because it's a, it's a the series is tied one one, so it's, it's practically back to, to to zero. That you won one, no. You I actually won. disagree. I actually think Boston needs to win Game Three more than Golden State needs to win Game Three. No, no, no. I'm not saying that they don't need to. Like, obviously, it's more beneficial for them, right? Like, it helps them more than it does Golden State. But I'm just saying they also need to play well. Like, they need like it, it's more important that they play well the whole game, all four quarters than it does if they win, because th this team Ooh. is, is pretty young and is going to, you want to see how they're going to do in the future as well. 
you're you know you have a rookie coach he's going to get out coached it's not his fault it's just what happens when you're going against a guy who's been coaching a team this, this for i don't know at least what i think almost 10 years at this point i'm going to look that up at least 8 cuz the golden state warriors have made six finals in the past 8 years and two of them that they missed he was the he was the coach so he's been there at least 8 years He's been to six, this is his sixth finals. He knows he just he has the experience. He can out coach him. Eight years. He's been a, he's been in the head coach eight years. Okay, so like I said, that's still close to ten years. It's almost ten years. That he that's just significantly more coaching experience. It's going to be hard. This this was always a, a tough series, going to be a tough series for Boston. The fact that they stole game one is what saved them from this being potentially a, a big problem, going, especially when you lose this the second game this much. So I understand winning the next game is important because you don't want to be down 2-1. Still, you're still home, but you don't want you never want to be down 2-1. You want to be the team up 2-1 because I think... I, can you look up the percentage of teams 79%. that win? 79%. They've mentioned it many times during the playoffs. Game 3 winner 1-1 one, one series is 79%. But there's a reason why I think Boston needs to win game three more than Golden State. Boston needs to keep home court advantage as much as possible in this series. Boston wants no part of Golden State taking back home court advantage. And you want to you want to win game three, A, to stay ahead in the series, and B, to keep pressure on Golden State. If Golden State wins game three and takes home court back right away, now Boston's looking at a must win in game four. And that's why I think Boston, for their sake, I don't care how badly they play. I think they need to win game three. No matter how badly they play, they need to win game three if they, to maximize their chances of winning the series. Fair enough. I, I, I understand from your point as well. Um, remember, remember the great Herm Edwards. You play to win the game. Don't, it doesn't matter if you, it doesn't matter if you like miss all your three pointers, et cetera. You must win the game. Well, they're not winning the game if they miss all their three pointers. I don't think so either, but just saying. I think that, like, I mean, the fact that they had a bad game from almost all their starters is uh, what three hurt start, them. Let's put it this way. Three starters combined for six points last game. If they want to win game three, those three starters must score more than six points. They only had three players in double digits. The fact that they only scored 88 in modern NBA is almost unheard of, especially in a finals. They only, I think they only scored like 14 points in the uh, third quarter when Golden yeah. State was going on that run like they normally do. Yep. Um, boy, th this is this is making my seven-game series prediction feel very weak. I don't think I don't think your seven-game series prediction is weak. I mean, my specific prediction's already busted. Boston winning game one, but. My overall prediction of Golden State winning in six games is still alive. But the thing is that, like, if you think about it, like, Boston's best shot to win this series is actually, they should actually win games three and four. At the very least, win game three, because that way they could keep home court advantage as long as possible. They want no business, the Boston Celtics, of trying to win game seven in Golden State. While it has happened before that some team has won Game 7 in Golden State, you really don't want to tempt fate to like just automatically assume that you're going to win Game 7 on the road. Because it's not, even though it's happened before and very recently, I might add, you know, it's still difficult. You want to get this over, as, uh, the series over as soon as possible. So you want to, you want to try to, you want to try to win. I, I think the Celtics need Game 3 more than the Warriors because I think, if anybody can come back from two games to one down, I would pick the Warriors to come back much easier from two one down than I would the Celtics. No, I agree with that. I 100% agree that the win is much more important to Boston, but I also think playing well is very important. You can play well and you can still lose. Just don't forget that. I, and I understand that. But when you have the fact that Golden State hasn't had a great game in either of these games and you still look like the bad like you they don't look like the better team like even after a game one where they made a big comeback that's because golden state draymond was two for 12 
Andrew Wiggins was eight for 15. Kevin uh, Looney, Kevon, Kevon Looney was one for four. Steph was 12 for 25, and Clay was six for 14. That's not that. That's great. Your defense is working, <laughs> which is not the issue. Their defense has been good. Keeping the Warriors top one hundred eight and one hundred seven is good. This team has averaged, I think, one thirteen or close to that all season. So, uh, your their their defense is doing well. Their offense just needs to be consistent, and that's been their biggest problem all year. Is their offense isn't consistent? Yeah, just look at. Just look at the scoring totals from game one and game two, 120 and 88. That's a 32-point swing, my friends. You can't go yo-yoing like that up and down. You need a little There's more. a one-point difference between Golden States. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, I think that's really all we um, have for the you know the finals. Uh, we're going to be back next week. Uh, we're probably, we might be looking at doing uh, recording before game five either Sunday or Monday, depending on um, how things go. So again, thank you all for listening. Remember, like, share, subscribe, click that bell, comment down below, listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, and we'll catch you guys next time. Breaking news, Rashid Wallace is back in the NBA.